being on camera. One, two, three. That's good. So not too many of us are felons in here. But anyways, get started. My name's Bob Hickey. I'm out of Kalispell, Montana. We're here to talk about doing some ice fishing for walleye. And I've got a passion for fish and walleye. I'm kind of one-dimensional, but I'm spread now. I'm starting to catch all kinds of warm water fish. I do not discriminate against any fish that wants to bite my line and presentation. So one of the things I want to talk about right off the get-go, I always talk about is safety. There's going to be a safety pro. Jim Vassar is going to do one here later this afternoon, but safety is so important when it comes to ice fishing or anything outdoors. You owe it to yourself and your family to take the time and think about it and prepare and prep. I was at a business seminar one time, and a Navy SEAL got up there and said, luck is the residue of preparation. And I truly believe that, and I believe that about hunting, fishing, or anything I do. If I prepare enough, I believe I, I'll prepare some of my competitors when it comes to tournament fishing. How many of you military in here? Thank you for your service. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Really appreciate it. So, we'll get started. We talked about the safety. I can't emphasize it. I very seldom go on new ice without a set of tongs. And the reason why I do that is because I try to do a buddy system. I go with somebody. And I'm going to give you an example. My tournament angler fisherman friend of mine, Jason Mandel, was out fishing, exploring a new lake, going walleye fishing all by himself one day. I wasn't able to go with him. I told him, make sure you bring your tongs. Well, he goes out on there and he breaks through. And he breaks through for almost 200 feet trying to get back out. Took all his fingernails off, everything. The ice was thin, he broke through. And it was a good thing he had his tongs. But I'm just saying, if the buddy system, you could have been able to throw him a buoy, which I have one right here. I don't know what I do with the other one, but here's mine. These things are cheap to throw in your bucket. They're a little weight with a rope and you can throw it out to somebody and get a hold of them and be on safe ice. So I usually do never, ever go out on the ice without one of these. It's either tied onto my four-wheeler my snowmobile, or it's in my bucket. So, but Jason's alive today because of these right here. And he's a big, strong man, and to break ice for a couple hundred feet, uh, you know, I'm, it, it, it could have been a catastrophe, to tell you the truth. But he was by himself, and those things happen. So keep that in mind when it comes to safety, okay? And, you know, communicate. You know, call down to Snappies. You know, look on websites. Find out whether or not that ice is strong and, and good and safe for you. And always be leery. You know, when you go out there and you got, you know, there's guys that got the bonfire out there, you got kids with you, you stay clear of those places. Stay clear. Another thing, too, is observe current. A lot of our tributaries, eastern Montana especially, whether it's Fresno, not so much uh, Valier, but Fresno, Tiber, especially Fort Peck, they draw out of those dams. And there's a current in certain areas, and it'll actually cut the bottom of that ice, so be extra careful. Good example, we were fishing Fort Peck, Forchette Bay one time, and we do what we call a run and gun. So somebody's drilling and another guy's coming behind with their Vexlar looking for fish, and that's what we were doing. And I was drilling and Jason was dropping down his jig, and every time he dropped it off, it would take off, and we go, oh, well, what is going on? And the current was so strong in the narrows there, it was taking his jig in his middle and, and going, <laughs> going down the flow with it. So. Keep in mind, that's something to be really cautious of. Be observant of your surroundings. You know, really be careful. Watch the weather, especially in eastern Montana. Watch the weather. When they say two inches, two inches over there, 30 mile an hour winds can be 10 foot drifts. Take it from me. Been locked up at Fort Shet one time, and uh, luckily we got out next day or two. So keep those things in mind. So keep that in mind on the safety. One other thing, housekeeping. There's nothing worse than going on the lake and finding debris. I know things can fall out of your ice houses, out of your buckets, off your four-wheeler, out of your pockets, but be conscious of that. You know, a lot of times, you know, I hate to say it, it is public ground, it's public water, it's all of ours, but there's nothing worse than going into there and finding debris, coffee cups, beer cans and stuff laying all over. Unacceptable, I'm gonna tell you that right now. And don't be afraid to, you know, Man up, women up. If you see somebody leaving some up there, call them out on it because this is our backyard. We don't want to destroy these opportunities to be able to go out there. A lot of times we're using private property to get out of some of these accesses. The last thing we want to do is lose those opportunities. So keep that in mind. Another thing, this is an interaction for all of us. Yeah, I'm, I'm 
very much into walleye fishing, whether it's open water or hard ice. But this is interaction. There's a lot of people in here who have a lot of experience. Bob Keebler here, Lauren Ely. A lot of you guys have more experience than I do. So it's OK to interact in here and have a conversation and talk about things if you have something to contribute to this presentation, OK? So we'll get started into some of this. I mentioned the body system. I mentioned communication, networking, find out what's going on, where's the bite. Uh, it's really important. You can eliminate a lot of time and effort and finances by using your telephone. Bottom line, and, and if you have a computer on the website too. So don't be afraid to reach out to people. There's people out there fishing all the time, and there's access to good information, and there's nothing wrong with taking a shortcut. So think that about that. So one of the things I like to do is when I come to a body of water, whether it's Lake Francis, Tiber, Fresno, Nelson, Fort Peck, any of those tributaries, I look for transitions. Brand new ice, okay, and we're going to talk brand new ice. Just got on there. It's, it's the most risky, but at the same time, it can be the most rewarding. Is I like to go fish where I last caught fish in open water. Because a lot of times, those fish are still there in that spot. So keep that in mind. The other thing is I look for any type of structures, whether it's drop-offs, whether it's where the river comes close to the bank. A lot of times that's a place where walleyes like to go up and feed, push minnows up in against, in against the bank and they'll slough back off. So always be looking for that. Underwater structure, frost heaves. Those things, sometimes those heaves can be underwater just as much as they are on top of the ice and above the ground. So those are great places. And another thing is white ice. Sometimes it's drilling on white ice, which is good ice, it covers you up where if you're in shallow water, you do not telegraph the shadow. And I know fish in shallow water sometimes uh, don't take much movement or much noise and those fish will blow out from underneath you. So keep those things in mind. Any questions yet so far? Okay, great. Get my glasses on for you to see what I'm doing. So again, I talked about structure. You know, uh, all these flooded uh, reservoirs that we fish here, in especially eastern Montana, they have uh, what you would call some of them have roadbed, old roadbeds, where they're gravel, got weeds along the edges of it. I love targeting weed edges because walleye and a lot of our predatorial fish are ambush fish. They love to set up and they love to sit there and they love to ambush. I call them highways. Anytime I can find, and I'll find these in open water too, so I don't discriminate. If I can find places where there's weeds and structure in open water, I'll put that in that metal note or I'll GPS it or remind it, write down a note. Here's a place that fish are traveling through, and it don't take much. It could be a one foot transition, it could be a weed edge, it could be a lot of different things that cause those fish, but they're traveling through there, they're moving through there, and you want to be able to intercept them when they do that. And I do not ever discriminate the water column, ever. I use a Vexlar religiously when I'm walleye fishing. I have cameras, I use them for all the other fish too, but I prefer my Vexlar. And what I do is when I set up my Vexlar, I set it up. And I'm going to show you my top four walleye presentations. These are the four that I are, have tied up right now when I go. These are the four that I'm going to be using. So, and I do change them, but here's an example. My number one favorite jig in the middle presentation right here is a 16th ounce jig. It's a fireball with a huge hook gap. And the reason why that hook gap is on there for I can get deep into that fish's mouth and up through the back of his head. I'll give you an example of that. There's some nice gulp, and I do use gulp quite a bit. It works great, and it works really good where you're not allowed to use minnows, which is Western Montana. A couple different ways I'll hook this up. One is traditional, just like this, right, right through the nose, just like that. And I'll let it sit there, and I'll bounce it back and forth. That is probably about the liveliest as you can get it because it's pretty flexible and it's good. And I'll go from the bottom and up. I, I work on cadences. Cadences could be three times in the mud, then lift it up and pause, three times in the mud, lift it up and pause. Whether it's open water or ice fishing, I try to figure out cadences. An action creates a reaction. And if any of you have been to my seminars, you know that I drive home an action creating a reaction. And the reason why I do that is because something caused that fish to react to your presentation. And you want to make sure you lock that down because that's how you're going to put more fish on top of the ice because those fish are related to it. Something triggered that fish to bite it, that's what you want to do. And, and I love that I love fishing with a jig in the middle because it's lively. And I'll watch my Vexlar. I'll set the Vexlar up where it just barely sees this. 
It's just barely a light green tint down there off the bottom. And I'll fish the whole water column though. Like I said, I do not discriminate because those fish aren't always on the bottom. And a lot of times if you're on the bottom and they're two, three, four feet off the bottom, they're, you're, you're subject to miss those fish. Where most fish that we fish in North America are eyes center up. That's just the way the fish are. And it's easier for fish to come up, easier for fish to see up. And walleye are like the best train retriever you've ever seen. They will follow this thing up and they cannot resist chasing it sometimes. So here's an example. You got a fish that came in, he's sitting here looking at it, and you're sitting there working at it, and he ain't, he's being neutral. He ain't doing it. You just start lifting your rod tip, lifting your rod tip, lifting your rod tip. And I, I, I've lost track of how many times that's caused that reaction that fish, he just can't resist it. And I've also reeled down a little bit just to pull it up, and it's a little different action. It'll come up, but depending on what's going on to cause that fish to react, I'm going, okay, I'm just going to jerk, 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 wiggle, 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 wiggle. If that caused that fish to bite, that's what I'm going to do the next time. If I was just lifting it up nice, calm, and it caused it to bite, that's what I'm going to lock down. Whatever it took. One of the things I've learned a long time ago, and somebody else said, I'm not original, don't quit doing what you were doing to cause that fish to come in. Because so many times with cameras, a lot of us use cameras, you're sitting there going like this, the fish comes in and you stop. Well, a lot of times it starts spinning. It does something different than what it was that fish to react to to come in the first time. So keep those things in mind. Questions? Okay, jig in the middle. That's one way to do it. Another way I'll do it is if I'm going to manually run a jig in the middle, and this usually will kill that minnow, but it's a great presentation. I'll thread it on just like that, and I'll set it like that because it doesn't matter because I'm going to be working that rod. These are these new eagle, eagle uh, Fenwicks. They're ex they're extremely affordable. I love them. I totally love them. They got a cork handle. They got a real seat. I, I run presidents just about everything because it's one of the most affordable, good quality reel you get. I set all of my drags where I can sit there and drag it out. I mean, I got to pull on it to get it. This is what, kind of a light finesse type rig, and this is what I use it for on a little bit lighter type stuff. But again, it's the President 20, it's the legal uh, Eagle medium light, 27 to 28 inches. I change it up. If I'm outside my ice house, I'll go a little bit longer rod because I got more. But I don't know how many of you ever set the hook in an ice house and had your rod. Anybody ever have that hit the top of your ice house when you set the hook? No, I have a lot of times. I guess I've overreacted. But a little shorter rod works a little bit better, plus it's easier to pack. But And I'll run four to six pound line. I like floral carbon, four to six pound, usually 100% floral carbon, Berkeley floral carbon, that's what I run. There's good lines out there, all kinds of good lines, don't get me wrong. It's whatever, yes sir? Um, these reels are, actually I got them right here, and plus you got 10% off, so you got to check that out, because Snappy's are on a sale today. This one here is the tw uh, President, this one's about 80 bucks. The reels are, oh, hang on, excuse me, I got one right here. Great question. 29 bucks for those rods. And, and I'll pass these around. One's a medium, and the reason why I got a medium is because for running chicken wraps, a little bit heavier type stuff, a little more aggressive, you need a little bit stiffer rod, okay? But when I go in finesse, that medium light is amazing, and plus it's versatile. You can use it for perch, whatever. And I've caught a lot of fish. Well, my biggest walleye, 16 and a half pounds, on six pound tests. So just saying, you can catch a lot of fish if you have the right equipment and you know, you got good line, good reels, good rods. And you know, there's nothing worse. But like I said, don't be afraid to check. I'll pass these around. One's a medium, one's a medium light. And I highly recommend them. They got a great price point. And I, they're warm feeling and they work good. So keep that in mind. Yes, sir. Uh, I know this is walleye, but it's like a medium weight, like a good weight for yeah, medium's good, and you can feel that medium when it gets back to you. Medium's a great all-around rod, especially if you're going to run it. A lot of guys like, let's say you're going into more of a pan fisher, and even walleye, but walleye usually are pretty, my experience, ice fishing, they're pretty aggressive when they hit. They, they just don't come in there and, like, you know, a big jumbo perch will come in, you don't even know they grabbed it. You can watch it go in and watch it go out. And the reason why I run four and six pound test is, I learned this during open water fishing, is a fish does everything it possibly can to displace that water through its gills to eat this presentation, no question. So they suck that water through, and the lighter the line, I truly believe this, the lighter the jig, the 
farther in that that presentation is going to get, and the better chance you got for hook sets. The other thing I always do is all my hooks, I grab them, I check them, make sure, because you know what? Factory's a factory. I don't know how many of you work in factory, but it ain't always 100% quality. So check your hooks, make sure it's strong, and I always just bend it out just a little bit, because I've had walleye grab a hold of it, collapse it down, and they open their mouth up and it falls right out. Anybody ever have that happen to them? Yep, it, it, and it's amazing how many times, especially in open water, I've done that. They, they're so tense, they can grab that, collapse that down, and you don't even get a hook in them. So by opening it up just a little bit, you have a higher probability of a hook set. And I, I believe it helps by probably, probably around 20%. Yes, sir? Yeah, so a question he has is light line, teeth raking, um, you know, risk of breaking off. There, there, there is, um, but I got to tell you, for when it comes to walleye fishing, not pike, but walleye, I haven't had many fish break through my line on fluorocarbon line. I just have not had it happen. And again, one of the things I do is, you know, weather is, is critical. Say you're in your ice house and it's 60 degrees, you got the Mr. Buddy going in you're doing a happy dance, and then this, all of a sudden you decide to go outside and start fishing and it's only 15 degrees out. Well, the oil and grease that's in these reels will thicken up, so that'll change how that drag works. So you need to constantly work on it because there's nothing more frustrating to go to set the hook and have something go wrong. So always be checking that. Another thing I meant, good question is I always retie. After I catch a couple of fish, I, I, I try to discipline myself to retie, especially on monofilament. Fire line, I do not. But when it comes to monofilament, four to six pound test, fluorocarbon, I'll try to retie every few fish, depending on how it is, because it's down there, you know, wrap, raking around the ice. You don't know how that hook's on there. It's raking around. You know, those fish have got sharp gills. I mean, they'll cut you every time you get your fingers by them, so it'll cut the line, too. So, great question. Any other questions? So, medium light, light presentations, jig in the middle, there's nothing wrong with that. It, it, if you can get a hold of leeches in the winter, they work. Night crawlers work. Wax worms work. They all work. It's a presentation. So, you know, an action creates a reaction. So I want to drive that home. Remember, whatever you caught that last fish on, remember what you did for you can catch that next one. And it, you do it until it quits working. So, medium light. I mean, I got that thing cranking. I and mean, this is only four pound test. And I can't break it. And, well, I mean, I could break it, but I'm not trying to. So it'll, it'll pull in just about anything you want to pull in. Just take your time with it. Any questions on going on the light side? We're going to go into more aggressive here pretty quick. Any questions? Okay. Of course, I got my nice little even claw rod caddy. And I do, this is one of Snappy's, but I do have one of these. And you know, you start getting, you know, $50, $75 into a rod and reel. And to his point, you got line running around. Line management's critical. You just throw them in a bucket. Say, for instance, you throw it in a bucket. And it sits there and it rubs, rubs on the edge of it as you're walking out through there or you got in the back of your pickup running down the road 70 miles an hour. Be conscious of what's going on because you might have a meltdown when you have that fish of a lifetime on and it gets off. So keep that in mind. Uh, another thing when it comes to fish conservation, I'm all about eating walleye. I love eating them. Um, I'm all about letting go big females when I can. When you're ice fishing, rule of thumb is never keep a fish out of the water longer than you can hold your breath. That's that's one of the things we've always tried to drive. And do everything you possibly can not to drop it off into the snow. I mean, they'll frostbite just like anything else. And so try to handle them carefully. Be extra careful. And watch what you're doing. If you're going to reach down and pull them up, make sure you're in the right place when you go to pull those fish up out of the water so you don't da damage them. And, and that way you got you know years and years worth of more fish to go out there to fish them and generations of fishing as well. So, any questions on this finessing? So one of the things I haven't showed you yet is, how many of you got chicken jaw jackers? Yeah, well, a lot of people have them. But one of the things I do when I go to a new body of water for the year, and you're saying there's a group of us, say me, Warren, and Bob were out there, I'll set up two or three of these in different places where I, I plan maybe to fish, but I use them more to scout for me. Go set them up in two to three places structurally. Maybe there's a drop off coming off a point. Maybe it's a weed bed edge. Maybe it's up back in a bay. Or it's a tributary where I know between the last time I caught fish and the spring that those fish will start migrating in there to do their spawn in the spring. Fish will migrate. They'll go where the food is. So that's one of the things I'll do. I'll also use not only a minnow on it, but I'll also not even run it. 
I'll just use it as a dead stick just like you would a, a regular jaw jacker without, without the mechanics and or a tip up, say, for that example. I'll do the same exact thing. Another thing I'll do is I'll actually use a chubby darter, you know, a good example, here's a chubby darter, a good example is a, a jig and wrap or something that will cause that, it works, it's a presentation of a lot of our bodies of water, you can have four of those running while you're jigging. I mean, why not have them out there? I mean, there's nothing wrong with covering water. You're trying to find fish, and once I find fish, say there's an example out on a point, Nelson Reservoir, off the main island out there, kind of on the south side, I'm catching fish out there, which I have, just telling you. And I decide to go out there and I'm catching them on that. I will actually pick up the stuff, run over there, let those sit there and I'll sit out there and start jigging. Because I'd much rather catch them by hand, feel that clunk, feel that bite, reel it in, than that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a tool. All it is is helping me find fish. But it's funner to do it this way, just for the record. And remember, an action creates a reaction. So if you got this wheel on it and it's running up and down and you catch a fish, I wouldn't go take that wheel off and put the rabbit ears on or the tuft, because we're looking for what? An action creates what? See? Pay attention. Pay attention. Nice chubby darter jig and wrap. Catch a wall on that. So, got you tuned in now? All right, action creates reaction. So, Berkeley War Pig. These, now I have a swivel on here. I'm just doing this for presentation purposes, because I'll, before I can change things out. I will run swivels if they start twisting up on me bad. I usually try to tie direct. I tie basically three knots. I tie a polymer, a double trilene, and in open water, I'll try a snail hook for when I'm doing crawler harnesses and stuff like that. But when it comes to tying jigs on and these things, it's two, two primary knots. One is the polymer, and the other one is a double trilene. Those are the only two knots I've used for since I can learn to tie them on there. So any questions on that? So here, I got fire line, and I also have six pound fluorocarbon tied onto it. Anybody running fluoro fluorocarbon tippets on their fire line rods? Not too many people? Well, one thing a lot of people like about fire line is it's small diameter, it displaces the water well, it's light, but there's no stretch, which is very very good when you're trying to set hooks, especially the deeper you go. Good example. Six pound sensation, love it. And, and I learned this back in the day doing lake trout fishing. So here's six pound sensation. How much do I got there? Five, six inches of stretch, don't I? You don't stretch fire line, you get zero stretch. So you're gonna get a better hook set. When you go deeper water, there's an advantage to fire line and there's no stretch. And it's more sensitive, no question. Um, I use high vis green in the summer. People say fish are for sh sh shy of stuff. Well, if you ever think of what's in a body of water, what those fish are swimming through and what they're eating, how many of you ever cleaned a fish and found all kinds of stuff in them? Well, when they eat, they eat pulling in dirt, weeds, rocks, whatever they want to bring in. I've watched it with my camera, I've watched it sight fishing before, and I've seen it when I've cleaned fish. So I don't worry about so much whether it's my line color and stuff in there. Do I think they can be line shy? Absolutely, I do. That's why I run a lot of fluorocarbon. But I don't discriminate and worry about it because I don't, I don't think it matters that much. There's so much stuff in the water. I really do. Clear, clear lakes, I think a lot of guys will hedge to more floral carbon than they do the bright lines, but I think there's an, an advantage too of floral carbon because you can't see it underwater. Where you can see that line a lot more, I can. Whether the fish see it or not, I can't tell you. I really can. Right. Mono, mono and floral carbon does stretch still compared to fire line. Yep, I, I would use four or six pound, 100% floral carbon. That's insane, right here. This is what I probably have tied on there. This is six pound right here, but that's what I tie on. So, anybody interested in how that's, that system sets up the floral carbon to the leader yard? So, last year, I learned a, a really cool knot, like a super cool knot. And let me get this put away for I don't destroy myself. We'll get back to this. So there is some people who are interested 
how I go from fluorocarbon to either mono or uh, fire line, okay? So for demonstration purposes, I'll show you what I do. This knot is the simplest knot that I've ever found, and it either works or it don't work, which is the good thing about it. When you pull it tight, it either works or it don't work. I don't have a pair of scissors, but I do have a knife. So here's some high-vis six, six pound line, floor, uh, fire line, and we'll go on to six pound floral carbon. So you got your line, this is coming off the end of your rod. This is gonna be your tippet right here. Everybody follow me? I didn't bring scissors, but we're gonna work this out. And this is the most simplest knot I've, I've, I've found. And it, it's not mine originally, but I'll tell you what, I use it a lot. So I got my flow car will tip it four times more than I need. Get my glasses on, right? See what I'm doing. And it's the most simplest thing. So I got my fire line, right? Put my floor carbon right there. I pull it just like that. See how I got it? Take my two fingers. No more than four, no less than three. One, two, three. See what I did there? Just And then an overhand knot of the tag here, here, okay? It's the most simplest. Make sure I get it on there. Trying to make it simple. Sorry. So you go like that. Pull it all the way through. I got more than I need. Just like that. So all I did was three times over my fingers, then back through the loop, and you got to moisten it though. You have to moisten it. So I'm going to do that. And you grab both tags, you pull them tight, just like that, and there you have it. And it's strong, and, you're, and you won't even, you can't even see it. And that's good for whether you're ice fishing or, or open water. But that's the one I use, and I've done the, oh, the Albright and the double unit knot and everything, and I'm telling you, this is the fastest, easiest one I've found right there. And, the best thing you do is go home and sit, sit in a chair and practice. And, it, and the nice thing about this knot, though, if you go like that and it snaps, you didn't, it, it cut itself. And if it didn't, you got it. And I've caught, I just say dozens of walleye on that presentation right there. Six pound into a four carbon leader. So, any questions on that? Okay. Four carbon, now when you tie your knot, I'm not a problem with that breaking it. Okay, so floral car the question was floral carbon versus regular mono, having it break. One thing, double check your hook. Make sure uh, you lubricate. The biggest thing a lot of people don't do is lubricate. And I did it, I don't know, I don't have the presentation, but you gotta lubricate it. You gotta lubricate it a lot. I mean, if you can dip it in the water, dump it down in the water, that's the best thing. But, Put as much moisture on you can, because I noticed from floral carbon to mono, mono will slide a lot easier than than floral carbon, and I, I witness that a lot when I'm tying snells. And it, what I found is it's it's lubrication, and depending on the knot too. You know, we're like on a snell, you could do four or five loops. It's it's a lot harder to get that to stick than it is to go three loops. It just don't want to slide. So the question was is how do you get a, a good floral carbon knot to set and seat? And, and I truly believe it's it's the lubrication. You gotta have moisture on it. Does that help you out? Or, yep. So any other questions on that? So we're gonna get back into this. So here I have it set up on a medium jig and stick, Berkeley jig and stick. This one's set up with, uh, I think it's six pound um, fire line. And then here's six pound tip it again. So when I'm using these, I got my vexiller in the hole. I drop this down, I'll lift it up, and I'll hold it there. And then one of the things I'll do is I'll lift it up sometimes one to two feet at a time. And what I'm trying to do is call fish in. I'm trying to attract them. And I have a, a life scope. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but 
They're a Garmin Lifescope. And I, me and actually me and Clay were fishing out of Lake Maronan last year. And I would drop a 128th inch ounce jig down in. I'd watch fish 30, 40 feet away come flying in to get that. That tells me what fish can really do underwater when, I mean, when the water conditions are right. I was amazed that they could do it. So it kind of resonated with me all the different things that why I, we do things to call fish in and how far fish can actually come in. And I know in muddy conditions, I, I'll, bang, I'll bang the bottom, you know, in open water just to get them to come. Because if you ever click two rocks together when, when you're underwater, you can hear it ticking. Well, those fish have that lateral line. They, they sense it, they feel the vibration, they key in on that stuff. I mean, I don't know how many times I've dropped down, lifted up, and the fish came in. They came from somewhere, they weren't there to begin with, so they come into my scope, into my zone, so keep that in mind. This is a war pig, Berkeley makes it. Catch a lot of perch walleye on this thing. I mean, it's just a crawdad's presentation. It's got a heck of a rattle. I don't know if you can hear it, but it rattles really good, and it's got really good hooks. And I like to lift it up, drop it down, lift it up, drop it down, lift it up, drop it down. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I have more than one presentation in my tackle box. And usually multiple of them. And that's because I've caught them on different things. They don't always bite on this. So I'll try that. If I get fish that are neutral and I drop this in there and they won't take it, I'll switch over. And I'll switch over to my, probably my, my one of my top favorite spoon presentations, which is an eighth ounce rattling flyer. That right there, I probably caught more walleye on it, ice fishing than any presentation I have besides a jig in the middle where you can do it. And this thing catches everything. It don't it, it, it loves anything that has a scale on it. And what I like about it so say I'm Eastern Montana where I'm allowed to have minnows, okay? And even if I'm not allowed to have them, if I have frozen heads, which you can buy heads and you can buy stuff, I always switch off the top of the head and I hook it either through the side, like that, or I'll hook it right through, through the nose before I can get some meat on it because I don't want it falling off. Like, that and you know when you pinch it off there's going to be uh proteins i guess is a good example if i want to use the right word coming out of that well fish relate to smell sight and thing that right there is my probably my favorite spoon presentation whether it's been at fresno fort peck nelson valir literally pounded them on this no question that's where we learned to do it is that valir and we're sitting there and i would go in the, into the, hit the bottom three times, I'd lift it up one foot. Into the bottom three times, lift it up one foot. A cadence. A cadence. And whether it's open water or ice fishing, remember, cadence have a lot to do with how you call a fish in and how that fish will react. So I hit it three times and I lift it up. Hit it three times and I lift it up. Hit it three times and I lift it up. And I'd count to maybe 15 or 20. And I'm watching my Vexar. And when I see that block come in, I'll just sit there. And I'll try it. I don't know if I can do it in the water, but I'll get it where that, that thing is just the uh, it's just just sitting there teasing. You just see how it's just sitting there back and forth. And if they don't hit it doing that, I'll just start when I say start lifting it up because the reaction creates what? Reaction. Who said that? Fritz. Come here, Fritz. Somebody's paying attention. Here you go, buddy. Thanks for paying attention. So. But when I do that, and I lift it up, and he hits it, but don't be afraid. Say, good example, I'm at Francis. I'm in 14 feet of water. Don't, they'll come three, four, five, six, seven feet off the bottom and hit it. And it is crazy. When, when they start chasing it, like I said, it's like the best trained bird dog there is. I mean, they're on it. They're on the hunt. They're coming up. They're following it. You'll see it. How many have Vexlars? Most people have Vexlars or cameras or some fish-finding type capabilities. It is exciting to watch that fish coming up, following it. You're following this up. You can see this because, I, like I said, I have it set at green. I can barely see it. I know what the size is. And another reason why I set it at green, where it ain't a big orange thing, is because I can determine whether I have minnows down there by this thing because it's going to come up and show up similar size on my screen. 
So you'll see little green flashes because that's how I have the sensitivity set up. Does that make sense to you? So that's why I do that. So when that big, big block orange comes in, you know it's way bigger than what this is. And so I'll just sit there and I'll work that thing, see how I get it working. And I'll just start lifting it up, lifting it up. And if I get it to where I'm a little worried about in my ice house or if I'm not outside, I'll just start reeling it down and reset. And I'll stop and pause it. I keep working it up and down. I'm trying to figure out what's going to cause that fish to trigger because I have a lot of fish come in. I've watched them whether I've been sight fishing, whether I've been using Vexlars or camera. They'll come in and they reject me. <laughs> and, it, and there's nothing worse, because especially with a camera, because you can see what the fish look like. And it's terrible. And you go, oh, man, what did I do? What, what could I have done different? And, and it's kind of humbling, like a lot. And it happens. But, you know, you're always looking for the home run. You're trying to always find something. When that fish comes in, they'll react to it. So this rattling flyer right here has probably contributed to more nice walleye through the ice than anything I've ever used, besides probably running tip-ups on big trap lines, we call it. Where we'll get a half a dozen guys together and we'll run trap lines searching for fish. So questions on that? Again, medium rod. Yes, sir. It's called a rattling flyer, eighth-ounce fire tiger. Update. Oh, huh? You're a lure junkie? Yeah. Well, this is a good one to have. Because this don't just this catches everything. And that, that's another thing too, is whether it's the war pigs, I haven't got to this thing yet. This is the moonshine jig, which is probably swarming the country right now, these moonshines, but I'll get to that here in a minute. But it's a rattling flyer. And I'll, I'll, I'm gonna be around here all day. So if you have anybody has any questions, please. Let's discuss it. And if anybody else in the, in the audience has a, anything to contribute or add to the, what we're talking about, please do. I mean, a lot of experience in this room right here. A lot. We can start adding up. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in here. So really important. We want to share our experiences. So did you get her? <coughs> okay. Rattle and fire. Fire tiger. Eighth ounce. Perch like it too. Yes, sir. Uh, hey, Gio. Yeah, the uh, past year I discovered that Forage minnow makes a rattling. Uh, it's, uh... Gio's got a question. I noticed that I use a lot of forage minnows. Yep. With a drop hook for both walleye and perch, and I've even caught a 13 pound lake trout and a big white fish in the uh, flathead. But uh, they, have a, they make a rattling. Uh, Gee, similar, to similar to that, yeah. There, there is a lot of them like that. There's a lot of them, and I do use a swivel on these, just for the record, because they, they're line twisters. Because you can just see the way every time you lift it up, it wants to spin, spin around. And I, I think it's important not to have a lot of line twist, because a lot of times when those fish come in, you have a tendency to stop, and the last thing you want it to do in the circle of death. I discovered from uh, another good fisherman from the valley that he puts a sinker about five feet above his leader and then goes down to another i mean a, a, a swivel up there and then another swivel about three feet down above two or three feet a leader so that when you, you, you avoid a lot of that uh, twist that, you know, that's a good idea no nope, that's a great idea i mean open water i'll run double swivels on my bottom bouncers just for that reason good idea thanks jill any questions on any of that? So let's talk about locations, okay? I, I need to drive that home. So all of our bodies of water, especially eastern Montana, most of them are all reservoir impoundments. There's some flow in them. Rule of thumb is those fish will start targeting those inflows. And long before the ice is off, that's that's what they do. That's their system. That's where they go. They start to go there. If you're at Fort Peck, it could be up the dry arm. If you're at Fresno, it could be up up the Marias they're coming in there. If you're at uh, Tiber, it could be coming in there at Willow Creek or Marias there too as well. So keep keep those things in mind. Now Lake Francis, there ain't much flow in that. There's more outflow, you know, other than it's an irrigation impoundment. But there is some really good fishing on there and it's close by. It's only a couple hours in. You know, I, I look for structure, as I mentioned. I do not discriminate depths either. I usually start probably 14 feet or less when I start, unless I got insight from somebody saying, yeah, we're catching 22 feet off the point. Well, then at least I know where it's 22 feet. Get a map, look it up. Look it up on your computer. You know, a good example, Lake Francis. 
you basically got an island out there. You got a, a point that goes kind of southwesternly off of that thing. There's two deep holes on each side. They both hold fish, as well as those fish will come up in structure. They'll come up in the feed. They'll come up in, the, in up on those shallow points and uh, off those edges. So all the bodies of waters here have similar uh, makeups when it comes to that. No question about it. I mean, Nelson. I mean, you got islands out there, a whole bunch of sunken islands. You got bays. Nelson's a, a fish factory. It's a great place to go get nice size eaters. I always let the bigger ones go, but I don't want to flay a big fish. That's just me. Don't get me wrong. I got plenty on the wall, but bottom line is, if I get a 14 to 17, 18 inch fish, those are the best eating fish as far as I'm concerned. The best, easiest ones to flay. But, uh, you know, something to think about there too when you're keeping fish. And, you know, those big ones aren't always the best ones to eat. So, questions on any of that? Right. Yeah, pressure ridges, good point. We'll emphasize that. Um, almost, you'll see a lot of pressure ridges, and that's a, that's a, a lot of times it's underwater structure to your point. Pressure ridges can give you structure on top, which you got to be cautious of getting in and around them, but at the same time, a lot of times they go underneath water, and you'll see a lot of times where people have film or they're divers, they'll show underneath. I mean, it's just, it looks like the same as it does on the top, but it's underwater, and those fish will actually relate to it. It's this underwater structure. I really like it too, like whether it's Fort Peck, um, any of the Fort Shets area, uh, Tiber especially, anywhere where the creek or the original river channel went through, anywhere that maps will show you, where they come up close to a bank and it's steep, drop steep, and there's a little bit of a bench, we call them feeding tables. Anywhere I can find on a map where it shows almost just topographical, if you look on water, you'll see it actually. It's just like land, where it's a little less steep, flatter. Fish will have a tendency to go up and lay up on those things and feed, and then they'll slide back off. Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, activity, daylight hours probably. I mean, they open up a refrigerator just like us when they go to eat. And when they eat, they're eating. And you want to be there when they're eating and be ready for them. So, good question. Any other questions on that? Uh, thermal planes and stuff? Yeah? yeah okay. So, he mentioned thermal planes. So, throughout the year, whether it's summer or winter, there's the water's changing all the time. You got flow coming in, water temperatures are changing, you got ice going on top of it, oxygen levels are changing. I don't necessarily target any type of thermal clients. I look for fish. I trust my electronics. I, I, I mean, when it's open water, I hardly drop a line until I see what I'm looking for of my electronics, which I never thought I'd ever do that. But I spend more time with my electronics trying to find whether it's the structure or the location presentation type thing. I'm looking for a location that's holding those fish. But I trust my electronics. I just in areas one week and then a week Yep, it could be. So he mentioned he fishes one spot, and then he goes there the following week, and the fish are gone. Well, welcome to my world, because that's kind of how it works, too. And I've seen it from day to day. Those fish can go negative, they can go neutral. Sometimes you can see the same fish down here. You can drop cameras down and see them. They're just not biting. But remember, when you're targeting walleye, they're entrepreneurs. They like to eat. They're looking for feed. You know, there's a reason where they're in certain areas. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, as the year goes by, those fish are going to start cycling towards where they're going to do their business in the spring. And you want to start to figure out where that's at. But they do relate to points. They do come up on the shallows. They like the weed beds, whether it's Tiber, Miller Slough, all the way up to Johnson's Bottom. I mean, Willow Arm, any of those points will hold fish. And that's the nice thing about these, is you can set two or three over two over here, go fish over here, put two over there, and then go work your jigging rods and come back. So, oh, I caught a walleye over there. I'm going to move over there and fish some more. And I, we've done that. And that's the reason why we use those things. So, good, good, good questions. Any questions on the products, the, the rods or the reels or anything? Yes, sir. I think it's I think it's like total setups like 150 bucks without their rod. Yep, they're expensive. You're probably a discount today, though. Because everybody that's here today, there's a discount. Snappy, everything's on sale, so. The yep. jigging jaw jacker is thirty dollars off. So thirty bucks off, please said. So. Hundred bucks. Yep, that's pretty cheap. So I want to talk about this this new jig 
whether it's ice fishing or open water, it's it's I ain't sponsored by them or nothing. It's it's called a moonshine. They are nothing but a piece of lead, but they they catch fish and they they catch all kinds of fish. And what it is, they got a little baby set of wings on the bottom like a Johnny Darter. And when you lift it up, they swim down, and when they hit the bottom, they clunk hard because they're so heavy, so heavy. And this is called the bloody nose for a good reason. And this is just the smallest one. It's the number zero. I use a number three in open water, which is, I mean, it's an ounce, ounce lead. And I can't tell you the wall, I just smash them. You know, I mean, open water, ice fishing, they just smash them. But lake trout like them too. I know uh, Pete, Pete Stackle, he makes, makes some that he uses for ice fishing too, uh, for lake trout, which is basically the similar type design, but it ain't the moonshine. But this moonshine, it is the coolest little jig you ever saw. I mean, it's just... <laughs> It got good hooks and it's sharp. And when you lift it up, it don't come straight up. See how it kind of it already wants to fly around. It, it just it flies around and a lot. And you just lift it up and let it fly down and hit the bottom. And lift it up. And what a lot of times the walleye will do, believe it or not, sometimes they'll come and they just grab it. A lot of times they pin it, pin it on the bottom. So when it hits the bottom, say this is the bottom. When it hits the bottom, they'll go down and shove their nose right on it. And when you go to lift it up, you got the fish. And multiple times that's happened to me. And I know they're not biting it. it it's because it's, I'm hooked on the outside of them. It's not in their mouth. So they're pinning it. And I've had other people tell me that's what they're doing. They sense it. They see it. They run over it. And they get right over the top of it. And they pin it down. And I suppose that's what they do. I mean, maybe some, something it represents or uh, it's something that they relate to that they're used to doing. And they pin it down on the bottom, believe it or not. And that's called the moonshine. And again, that's on a... I got anything that's really heavy, I try to run on a medium type rod. Just because you gotta have something that's gonna handle it. And again, most I ever go is six pound test. Um, mostly all floral carbon. I will run six pound sensation. Um, I definitely love running the Fluger reels just because they have a good drag system and, and their price point's good. And I have a bunch of these presents. I love them. They're just super good. And one of the things I like to do though, just to re-emphasize, is I tighten my jacks up as much as I can, again, depending on weather conditions, to make sure, to make sure I can pull that thing down. You know, I keep going until I, right? Not at the break point, but at the point where I know I'm gonna get a good hook set, and that fish, if he wants to run, he can do it. It's gotta take quite a fish to do it, or I'm gonna be able to pretty much manhandle it, so, or woman handle it, or whatever they call it. So, questions on that? Do you have to uh, do an extra hook set on them, an extra jerk with a hard mouth? Um, question was, do you do an extra hook set on them with a hard mouth? I've done them both. I don't do it with fire line, I can tell you that much. Just because there's no stretch and you, you'll tear through them. There's no question. Monofilament, depending on depth. I mean, if I'm less than 12 feet, I'm not too worried about it. I truly believe and I mentioned this earlier, the fish does everything it possibly can when it goes to, to bite it. And I know how many of you are open water fish and you can feel them just ticking on it, ticking on it. Nothing there, nothing there. Well, they do do that. But when you feel that clunk and you, you're running good equipment, and I know I've had a lot of people roll their eyes at me, but I can tell when that jig goes over their teeth in their mouth. I'm going to tell you that right now. And there's no question whether it's ice fishing or open water. I know where that jig is. I know if he just bought, I know if he just grabbed it or if he inhaled it. And how, I mean, I don't know how far it went in there, but I know it went in and he pulled it in hard. And usually while I hit aggressive. When you lift that thing up and you're working that thing up and you're coming up, he's coming in, he's coming in, and he's going to drill it. And this, is, and this is nothing for, you know, a 14-inch walleye to engulf. Matter of fact, I've seen 14-inch walleye with 8-inch fish in their mouth. I mean, it, it's amazing what... What they'll do but i usually don't do double hook sets i usually do one real good hook set and i'll do everything i can to make sure the rod's doing the work let the let the rod and reel do all the work as much as i can try to keep my line as much as i can in the center of the hole for it ain't grinding on the edges of it trying to chew on it and if i got the buddy system come over here and help me get this fish out because it's sometimes hard to reach down and get the fish up out of the hole you know and hold on to the rod so good question other questions Yes, Gio. Well, uh, Got to speak. Keep your hook sharp. 
Question was, keep your hook sharp. Like I said earlier, when you check your hooks, make sure they're sharp from the factory. Make sure it'll stick in your, here's a good example. Make sure, hopefully I don't shove it in too hard. Make sure that thing will stick into your stick into your fingernail. I mean, when you put it on there, you want it to grab. You want it to feel it. And don't be afraid to feel it with barbs. Another thing, be careful too. If you're gonna get a hook hone, I don't use a file, I use a hone. Because these are small hooks, file just eats them. And I try not to go from the top unless it's bird back. I usually go from the side a little bit because I don't want to shorten it. I want it to stay as long as it can. So I always go off the side a little bit and feel it. But that's a great, great point. Keep sharp hooks because walleye, well, a lot of the fish we fish, they're all bone. It's all bone and teeth. And you want to drive that hook in there and you want it as sharp as you possibly can get it. And, but you want it sharp. I mean, you want it to stick in there. So good question, good point. Other questions? Yes, sir. What's your preferred hole size? Hole size? Yeah, I got everything from four big yep. zero. Yeah, great question. Hole size. So depending on what I'm fishing, I have everything from a six to a ten. If I'm running tip bucks, a lot of big open water, I'll run a ten inch gas auger, depending on where I'm at. Especially if I'm over at Fort Peck, or even I was over at Cascade here a couple of years ago, and the ice was you know three and a half feet deep. I, I couldn't get through it with my electric. I run a, I have a six inch pistol and I have an eight inch pistol and I, I actually pretty much always use that six inch. It's amazing how big of a fish you can get out of there. So um, I like it because it's so light. No gas, ergonomics, almost anybody's 18 volt DeWalt drill will run one of those things and they're just so light. I mean they're just the way things are going and, and from an ergonomic standpoint, you know, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with a good old gas jiffy auger or strike master or whatever but at the end of the day you got usually propane or fuel you got other things and you know it's you know a few pounds versus 30 or 40 pounds a big difference when you're dragging out but my, my thing against the 10 inch is the number nine would go down and i get all excited and i step in my own damn hole oh yeah and so he said he said it's easy to step in your own hole i think all of us have stepped in you don't step in the six inches as bad these little, these little guys yeah, little guys. Well, it, and that, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's another thing from a safety standpoint, too. If, if you're on any of the body of water, especially in western Montana, spears are supposed to mark their holes in their areas. A lot of times you'll see sticks out in the Thompson chains and stuff. Be cautious around that because that's what that they're doing is they're spearing in there, and you never know how big. You get a fresh couple inches of snow on you know, a quarter inch of ice, you don't know what's underneath you. So always be respectful of your surroundings and keep an eye on things. So other questions? Any other questions on jigging up walleye, locations, presentations, where to go fish them? Where to go? You like that? So if I was going Fran Francis right now, I'd go right to the island, and I'd either go off to the right or the left side of the island point going off. There is there is walleye in Knoxon Reservoir. I have never ice fished Knoxon Reservoir. I've opened water fished it a few times, but I've never ice fished. Anybody's ice fished Knoxon? Geo with you? I have. You have? I grew up around that area. I have never trusted the ice to be thick enough. Yeah. So warm water. Yep. It's warm water, and there's a lot of flow. Knoxon has a lot of flow compared to a lot of. That's a great point. Thanks. Um, yes, Geo. Yeah. Spot on Knoxon Reservoir and stay there, you can catch pike as long as your leg. Pike as long as your leg on Knoxon if you want to sit there. Well, there is some bays and cups that you probably could, but you know, you know, Snappy's got some, you know, the Strike Master floating suits. Safety first, you want to talk about it? You're going on iffy places, I advise you to have one. Buddy system, have one. You know, you want to protect your rods, have one. You want to go ultralight? Have one. You want to go see what's going on underneath the water? Have one or two. And I'm serious. I mean, they're tools and, and they're entertaining too. They're a lot of fun because they teach you what you shouldn't should be doing because you're not doing what you should be doing because they just told you you didn't do it right because something didn't work out. But any other questions? Anything that anybody has specifically that I mean, don't be afraid to ask questions. If there's somebody in here who can answer it. If I can't answer, I guarantee you. I mean, we're here to learn. I mean, you know, anything. You go to Forchette, watch your weather. It's a long ways down, 50 plus miles of gravel. You never know. Like I said, two inches of snow can turn into 10 foot drifts. Trust me, been there, done it. Got the t shirt. 
Huh? Four Does package. The shirt still fit? Huh? Does the shirt still fit? Does the shirt still fit? Oh yeah, I lost a lot of weight. Shoveled snow for 13 hours the first day trying to get out. Didn't make it. So, <laughs> good question. You got a question? Yeah. Uh, the 18 is what I have. And it's, this one here, the 18 is 509.99. And you can use it in open water too if you want. I know guys that do it, especially if they're anchored up. They're, they're a great tool. I mean, they're easy to use. They tell you what's going on down there. I mean, you can see a lot with it. And it tells you what's going on. I mean, you can flat see your jig. You can flat see your swivel. I can, I can tell you right now, switching gears to a perch, I can tell you when I lose my wax worm or my maggot off my jig because that little green just got put in half because I noticed the profile changed. But it's a tool. If you watch this stuff, you can learn a lot. I mean, it ain't nothing worse sitting there with no bait on because sometimes you need bait to catch fish. I do. Warren, he catches it without bait, but I don't. I got to have bait. So, any other questions? <coughs> got to have some. Action creates what? Reaction. Bob. And let those senior citizens beat you guys. I think we had a tie. A couple more things. Well, I want to thank Snappies for allowing us to come in here. At least it's in a nice, warm environment. John, thank you. Appreciate it, as always. You know, this is a, this is a, this is a learning room. I mean, we come here and learn a lot of things. It's a place to gather. Remember, though, communication. I always used to say this word, communicate, communicate, and then communicate again, because a lot of times we have a shortage of communicating, and so do I sometimes. You can never communicate enough, and that's whether you're asking questions or learning or trying to figure out stuff. So don't be afraid to re reach out and, and talk to people about things. Um, any questions on any of the jigging wraps or any of those type of products? I mean, these Johnny Darker darters that I'm tossing around, these things are good too. These are a good all around, almost any species type fish. They work really good. I think most of all, the best thing to do is enjoy life and have fun. And more importantly is the people you get to share it with. So keep that in mind. It's fun to share. Yes, sir? Good, good question. Uh, mention of the inline. Uh, I have one. I have a Fluger. Chad, you have some inlines. I know a lot of the guys that are pan fishing love them because they get zero line twist. It comes off. Um, Chad, any positives or negatives? I know you do a ton of fishing with them. So. I'd say probably the negatives would be uh, super low temperatures. They don't really like super low temperatures. And huts are fine, but... Yeah. Outside, whole hot, it's not very really low temperatures. They just kind of seem to freeze yeah. up. So low temperatures, he said, was a negative, but that could be on any of these reels. I mean, you got grease and oil in them, and things stiffen up. Like I mentioned, make sure if you're in the house one minute, and you're out 15 degrees or below zero, you're going to react different. There's no question. Light line, yes, sir. What do you do to keep your line from guides, your line from freezing up in your guides? Well, I've always thought a guy should get, somebody wants to get the patent, John might, a battery operated, put in a couple doubles, and it goes all the way through and heats up your rods. I mean, they can heat up everything else, but um, I've always thought about doing that. I know guys that will use PAM spray will do it. Um, there's some, there's some de-ice, products out there, but one of the biggest things that I found works is having the right size eyelets. And that's one of the things I love about these Fenwicks that uh, Snappies has out there in the price point, is they're big eyelets. And it gives you a little bit more room. But I'm probably with most of you, I'm always going, I'm, I'm trying to clean them off. Doug? It doesn't stay long. It don't stay on? He says he used up a can and a half. <laughs> well, it, you know, it doesn't hurt the experiment. There's things out there that don't freeze, but what does it do? You know, I mean, I know some guys that don't wash their line. Yes, Chad? Those, uh, those thin titanium guys work really well. What was that? The thin titanium guides. Thin oh, titanium guides, which yeah. I'm not too sure if these are Fuji or titaniums, but these don't... I've been using them. I used them out there on Smith the other day, and it was only about 
six, seven degrees out there a couple weeks ago out there, and I didn't have much. I was in the ice house, but I was in and out, but I was really surprised. No heater or nothing, I didn't have any problem, but. Sure. And that ice got me. Well, I think all of us have set our rods down into the slot and pulled them up and they're all iced up. There's nothing worse. Another thing I, I was going to mention too is one thing I like about the, the, these presidents, they do have a little bit of a nice gap in here. So if you do have a glove on, it gives you a little bit. There's some actually some really nice reels out there in today's market that have actually a little extended length on them for you. You can have your gloves on and stuff. So, you know, stay warm. Don't let your line ice up on your eyelids. Any other questions? I got some nice giveaways that Snappy's donated, so um, everybody got a ticket. Any other questions before we get going? Yes, sir. I have my comments, maybe. I don't know. Okay, he has a comment. He don't know, but he's got a comment. Yeah. Tent seal silicone spray. Yeah. Oh, graphite. Well, graphite lithium might be a good idea, for, especially for your reels. It works real good on my door seals. On his door seals. The door's increasing. Oh. Mike, hey, try good idea. Mike. Try mounting some beeswax on the islands. Beeswax? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. In this area? Yeah, I mean, like we mentioned, there's no walleye in our backyard other than Noxon. And I personally, I, I can't put you anywhere to go ice fishing there. I, I really don't know it. But if you're going to fish around here, whether you want to go pan fish, you know, Smith Lake's a great place to go pan fishing and pike fishing. You're all the pike you want to catch, and it's active. And it's very entertaining. If you want to have a lot of fun with kids or anybody, grab yourself a camera or borrow a camera from somebody, put that thing down there, and you go in there with one of these, or you go in there with one of those, or go in there with any type of a jig, any ice fishing jig, you're going to be entertained for the day. There's no question. How many people fished Smith already this year? How many people caught a pike out of there this year? So, yeah, every time. So that'd be if you. And it's close. I mean, 20 minutes you're out there, and, and it's close. You know, there's upper and lower still water. It was a little bit bigger drive. Yes, sir. How big are they running out there, in Smith? The pike. Whew. I mean, the ones I caught were probably 16 to 20 inches. But there's bigger ones. I seen one go through. It took a long time before he got through my hole. I mean, I was watching him. I mean, it, it was it was about that wide. It was a toad. I mean, Chad, you caught some nice ones out there, haven't you? I mean, yeah, I caught uh, caught a really nice one, at least a 35 plus on the camera the other day. Yeah. Um, I know uh, Ron who works in the fishing department. He can give you all the information you want on that lake and catching pike. He's good at it. He's been catching a lot. He fishes out there a lot. So, yeah. But there's a lot of lot of lakes. I mean, there, I mean, I think I don't want to exaggerate. There's like a hundred and some lakes within 150 miles of us if you start looking, and they all have fish in them. You know, they're the Thompson chains. But again, make sure the ice is right. Make sure you're paying attention to your surroundings because you know it's, it's been cold, but you know McGregor's still wide open. So I'm just telling you. There's still open water out there, so safety first, please. Good. Answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, I'm running either Aquaviews, pretty much, or Markham's. Uh, Chad, or not Chad, what do you, you're running e -O -Yos, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's Clay? Right here. What do you run for cameras? Uh, Markham 9. Markham 9, so they have Markham's out there. I'm running um, Aquaviews is what I got, and I got... The little ones that I got, I mean, they're nice. I mean, they're only a couple hundred bucks. So, those, they got a nice uh, selection of cameras out there. Uh, they're anywhere from a couple hundred up to probably around 600, I suppose. Three, 300? 1400. 1400? 1400. Well, up to 1400. Yeah. Okay. Well, Clay's got the 1400. As nice as he does not. She doesn't know about it. No, but again, get what you can afford. But it's a great tool, and they're nice because they're that big. The one I got, it's, I think it was, I think it was like, I don't want to exaggerate. It's like 300 bucks, and it's that big, and it's got. You can walk around, you can drop it down in there, and you go, oh, no fish. Oh, there's one. Drop right in it. And I know some guys they got kind of a little caddy thing they got where they can just walk around with it, and look for fish. It's kind of a cool little tool, and it's it's neat too because like Smith Lake's shallow. 
but it's fun to watch it. It's very entertaining, and you learn a lot. I'm going to tell you right now, you can learn a lot, a lot of good and bad, because, like I said, you, you see a lot of times you get rejected, you go, why? I mean, they came in, or they didn't bite it all the way. You'll learn how finicky and how light a fish can bite, too. And I've, I've watched northerns come in, and they, they didn't even, all I see was my line move, and my jig disappeared. They didn't even hit it hard. Yes, Gio? Yeah, you can watch a big perch suck a maggot off your hook without making yeah, a good, Yeah, without even getting a hook in it. You know, I've seen it. <laughs> yep, good. Any other questions? Yes, sir? Are you doing any more classes like this? Oh, we're going to do another one in the spring, though. I know we'll do one in the spring in open water, and we'll do probably target walleye in the spring. And then there's two more after me. Um, there's uh, Rob. Rob, you in here? Okay. Yep. Rob's in the back. He's an electronics expert. Really good, knowledgeable. I mean, you, you want to stick around and listen. Just, he can help you. I didn't want to touch on that and push because Jim Bass was doing safety this afternoon. Rob's going to work on the electronics. I didn't want to drive down too more because he's going to dive deep into it. And he knows more about them than I do. I, I, I know enough to get by. And like everything else I have, there's probably a lot more I could learn and I should know. But I, I seem to only do enough to get by. That's more said of how I got through school too, probably. But it's just the way it is. I mean, there's there's tools that, you know, you get what you can do, but I, I know enough about them to use them and get what I want to get out of them. And you do. That's the deal. You get what you get out of them. You put more into it. And Rob will talk about that too and how to really dive, dive down into it. So, yes, sir. So he, so he brought up something, and I'm glad you did that, because I have it on my notes, is a lot of times in, in the water column, there's things that swim vertical in the water column, but there's more things that actually swim horizontal. And back to your 10-inch hole thing, one thing, I always ran a 10-inch, because that's all I could afford. I wanted one auger, I didn't think I was ever going to have one of those. And I ran one auger, 10 inch, but what I like to do, whether it's pan fishing, no matter what the fish, when I'm ice fishing, I'll get it and I'll watch it with my camera, I'll watch my Vexlar, I'll actually run my rod over to the edge and that thing will flow over. There's more things that swim actually horizontal or say in 45s and it does up and down. Don't get me wrong, up and down will cause fish to strike, but moving it side to side sometimes, you might, you know, you only move 10 inches up here and it takes a time for it to come over or six inches, but even in a six inch hole, doing that side-to-side -side weave, that can make a difference. And sometimes if you lift it up, then you know, kind of 45 it down, lift it up, and 45 it down, it changes things. Another thing, if you're fishing somewhat shallow water, say less than 10 feet, don't be afraid to bring your stuff up three or four feet and then drop it down. And this is just an experience thing, is it seems like I've had more fish come in shortly after I've dropped it down you know, I mean, a lot of fish will come in shortly after I dropped it down than when I'm just sitting down there doing that because I think they see it falling. Like I said, with my life scope, that thing came from 30-some feet away. I mean, just flying in there. I watched them numerous times come from long distance away right to a 128-ounce jig, which is pretty impressive that they were seeing that thing. So, um, But that side-to-side -side motion is a good thing to do. I always said it would be nice to take a couple chainsaws, run a 100-foot line, and just actually troll through the ice. But, you know, that's a lot of work. <laughs> Although one time, I take this back, one time at uh, Lake Francis, um, I was over there with Jason, and I took my jet boat over, and the ice was half off. And we caught two walleye on the edge of the break edge of the ice, and it was 18 inches. I could step off out of my boat onto the ice. It was 18 inches thick where it was off. And we caught two walleye. They weren't very big, but we caught two walleye. So I thought that was pretty good. It was ice on this side and open water on this side. So 